Hello everyone, Dan here from the Next Tissue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for Wolverine number 46, part 6 of the Sabretooth War. Let's talk about the creative team before we get into this book. This book is written by Benjamin Percy with and, and Victor Lavalle, with art by Corey Smith on pencils, Oren Jr. on inks, and Alex Sinclair on colors, with letters by Corey Petit. You'll see some really cool variants, uh, and also we have a lot of really cool preview art for this one. Uh, so, in this issue, Brain Changer Game Changer. Wolverine's me uh, memory has been altered, erased, restored, forgotten, and destroyed. This time, if he can't get his head on straight, Sabretooth will do worse than that. The most diabolical chapter of the Sabretooth War continues, and yet, and you thought those issues were violent. First of all, let's recap some of the cast here. So, we have the X Force, which is comprised of. Logan, Wolverine, uh, Domino, Kid Omega, who is uh, currently uh, deceased, we'll call it for now. Uh, we have Colossus. We also have Laura Kinney, the Wolverine, Black Tom Cassidy, Aurora, North Star, Sage, and Dakin, who is also in bits and pieces. Uh, we also have the Sabretooth, which is Victor Creed from Our Earth. Uh, Pretty Boy Sabretooth, who's been taken out. Captain Sabretooth. Who's also been taken out? We have Camel Sabretooth and Savage Sabretooth, a female version of Sabretooth. And of course, the Exiles. We have Oya, Third Eye, Necro Sinclair, Chris Colkis, and Mother Tomby, and of course, the ship. Uh, so there you have it. That's everybody that's kind of involved with all this uh, Sabretooth War business. Uh, once again, this issue just manages to kind of really top itself which is wild because we are six issues into the story and it just continues to do some amazing stuff that it's really cool exploration of Wolverine. Uh, in this issue, we see that Victor is leading Wolverine on this like mission by using the psychic powers and brainwashing him into, into having Logan think that he's doing a mission for X-Force from back in the day, as opposed to what they're actually doing on Krakoa. Right. Um, uh, which is very well done by the art. I think uh, one of the really fun, neat things that come up, come up to the surface is that Victor is tricking Wolverine, but it is brought to the reader's attention that he's also kind of enjoying reliving, reliving the glory days with Logan. Um, there's some really fun paneling and layouts where we see what's really happening versus what Wolverine is seeing in his head. Uh, it's kind of like a split imagery. Uh, and then we also have Laura escaping. We have the exiles showing up. Uh, so all the pieces are coming together now that we're in the home stretch for the story. Let's take a look at some of the preview art here. As I mentioned, I really love the way that this is set up, where we as the reader can see what they're actually doing versus, you know, what Logan is actually experiencing in his mind. Uh, I'm a big fan of the X-Force designs. I'm a big fan of like the way this is presented with the pink hue so that we understand that it is the psychic energy that's being kind of brought in. And of course, uh, really interestingly, we get to see all the obstacles that Victor kind of needs Logan to get through, right? So that's really fun. Um, I really enjoy this issue. I think the Sabretooth War is such an interesting concept that I don't know... Uh, I don't even know where this is going to go at the end, right? Obviously, this all leads to the follow Krakoa because everything's happening before that. But I'm very excited to see how that comes to a resolution. So. Hello, everyone. Dan here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for X-Force number 50. This is the final issue in the Target Beast storyline. Uh, let's talk about the creative team before we get into the book. This book is written by Benjamin Percy with art by Robert Gill, Guru FX on colors, letters by Joe Caramagna. Uh, Violent answers the end of a series. Um, very cool that I see. I mean, not every series gets to go 50 issues. Uh, so let's talk about this issue. The final battle against Beast in the landmark 50th issue. X-Force confronts Beast with their secret weapon, a final reckoning, not a dry eye in the house target beast finale um I, I didn't make a lot of notes while doing the review i really just kind of wanted to take this issue in 
and enjoy for what it is. I didn't read all of uh, X Force. I kind of skipped around a few arcs, but the story and you know Percy and the team do such a good job of reminding you of the stakes, reminding you of how we got here, uh, and these relationships. And I guess also because Beast had had been let down this path. Uh, you know, for the next era of, of X-Men, they wanted to kind of put things back into place, which I think it's a really interesting comic book, uh, you know, trope and, and way of storytelling where you kind of end up putting a lot of the pieces back the way you found them so that the next team, uh, when they take over or when they use the character, uh, that it's a recognizable character. Because the beast that we saw all throughout the X-Force run became unrecognizable. I would really love to ask Benjamin Percy what the what the mandate was or what the you know what the thought behind putting Beast through all this stuff was. Uh, there's some really fun moments of obviously current Beast talking to uh, the previous version of Beast that's kind of hanging out with Wonder Man. Uh, so let's take a look at some of the art so you can see exactly what I'm talking about. And as you can see here we have Wonder Man and a beast that the only difference I love that is that he's wearing glasses versus the you know contemporary beast that is wearing the cocoon suit. Uh, but they end up not only do we get a little bit of action here to kind of kick things off, uh, we also end up just having both of the beasts off together uh, to have a conversation while Egg Force kind of drives in into everything that's going on. Now, obviously, this is happening before the events of Sabretooth Wars, so that's why you'll see some of the characters that are here. Uh, which is really interesting. And of course, this is all happening before the fall of Krakoa. Uh, but I think, I mean, I'm going to miss a lot of the aspects of the Krakoa age, including those really cool suits that Forge put together. Um, but I think this is such a, first of all, a really great roster of X-Force, right? I think this was a really fun uh, roster, rotating cast. Uh, I think the team really did such a good job of really bringing everyone uh, into interesting stories. Like I said, I skipped around a little bit, but overall, the 50th issue closes out the X-Force arc in such an amazing way. I'm going to go back and read the arcs that I didn't read uh, and then maybe reread the last three issues here uh, for Target Beast because I think that it all has so much more payoff when you go through the whole thing. Um, so... Hello everyone, Daniel here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a preview for Deadpool number one. This is a new book from Marvel Comics. Let's talk about the creative team before we get into this. This is written by Cody Ziegler with art by Roger Antonio. Guru Effects on Colors Letters by Joe Sobino. We have another uh, Deadpool series coming out now from Marvel after one of my favorite runs from Alisa Wong. Uh, so let's talk about this one. A new era for the Merc with the mouth and a gun and a sword and Princes. Of course, we saw that uh, Princes was in the credit page. Uh, Cody Ziegler, who's been writing Miles Morales' Spider-Man, has a wild ride planned for the Merc with the mouth, introducing a terrifying new villain who won't stop until he catches Wade in his death grip. But all work and no play makes Deadpool a very dead boy. Uh, I wonder if the name of the villain is Dead Grip, since that's kind of what they highlighted in the synopsis. Uh, I like Cody Ziegler's work. I read a little bit of uh, the work that from the Miles Morales book that's kind of crossed over with some of the Carnage and Venom stuff. Uh, so I don't read the series issue to issue, but the stuff that I have read, I've really enjoyed. Uh, we're going to look at some of Roger Antonio's art so we could see what this book is going to look like. But I can tell you it's going to be messy. It's going to be dynamic. It's going to be in your face. Uh, and it's also going to be full of uh, pretty interesting confrontations. I think introducing a new villain for Deadpool, always a good thing. Uh, keeping Princess around, who is the the dog that's kind of has the, the the symbiote, the Carnage symbiote, or part of it, or it's got a symbiote on it. <clears throat> go go read the previous run so you know exactly what I'm talking about. But let's take a look at some of the preview art here. As you can see, right starting off. Right off with a bang. Although I do wonder who is uh, maybe who's who's lending way the airplane. I think that'd be interesting to find out. And as I mentioned, princes run around uh, back in Canada, it seems. Uh, and it makes sense that they're launching a new Deadpool series. They're also launching a Wolverine 
Deadpool miniseries, obviously everything leading up to the movie. But this is a panel here. This two-page spread. I love it. I love how it's laid out. All the action happening around you, but then you have this really dynamic shot in your face. Crotch first, because that's the Wade. Wade likes to run. Uh, yeah, really cool stuff. I'm, I'm pretty excited to check this out. Uh, so once I get a chance to read it, I'll definitely talk more about this. But if you have read it, let me know what you thought about it down in the comments. Hello, everyone. Dan here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a preview for Spider-Man Shadow of the Green Goblin. Uh, so let's talk about this book. Let's talk about the creative team here. This book is written by J.M. DiMatteis with art by Michael Santamaria. Uh, Chris Sotomayor on colors, letters by Joe Caramagna. We also have a few variant covers you'll see at the end of the video. Uh, this is very interesting because obviously DiMatteis is very, very, very famous writer with uh, when it comes to Spider-Man. Uh, but in this issue, Norman Osborn was not the first goblin, as is the goblin that we know, but he is not the original. Learn the shocking secrets of the proto-goblin who has not yet understood that with great power comes great responsibility. Also, Peter Parker is a very different person from who we know in this um, in this new story that continues to build the legacy and the mythos of the classic spider lore. This time, of course, paired with Michael Santamaria, who is a rising artist at Marvel Comics. So very interesting pairing. Very interesting uh, kind of pitch for the book as well, right? We have this proto-goblin. We have... A Peter Parker that's not fully the Spider-Man that we kind of know and love. So how will all this play out? Uh, so I'm very interested. Uh, uh, but let's take a look at some of the preview art. Because I want to show you. I'm not familiar with, uh, with the artists. So I want to see what are they bringing to the table. And just from the preview pages. Um, I like how it feels very grounded. Uh, you know, not so much into... Not your traditional superhero, like a lot of emotional, like the emotions captured in the faces are very strong, especially the second page. You know, we have Peter figuring out there's some overdue bills uh, and May missing Uncle Ben. You see the empty space on the bed, like all of it, very classic Spider-Man stuff. And who knows better than that than, you know, Dimitris. Uh And then, of course, we have uh, kind of a scummy guy. We, we know this is a story that we kind of know we've seen before. Or at least maybe a different facet of it. But I w I'm interested to figure out how is this Spider-Man different? How is he not the person that we kind of know from the comics already? So uh, I think it's going to be very fun to follow this series. I can't wait to at least check out this first issue to see if it's something that I would be interested in continuing to read. Um, there's a lot of good Spider-Man stuff out there. There's some Spider-Man that's not exactly for me. Uh, but either way, any way you cut it. I think it's fun. It's a fun time to be a Spider-Man fan. So, hello everyone. Dan here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for Alien: Black, White, and Blood, number three. This is a new book from Marvel Comics. Let's take a look at the creative teams here. Uh, so, of course, we have part three of the Utopia story, still being written by Colin Kelly and Jackson Lansing. With art by Michael Dowling, Chris Sotomayor, and Colors. We also have a new story, Gear in the Machine by Cody Ziegler. Claire Rowe on art, Jordi Belair on Colors. And then the last story, Lucky, written by Steve Fox, with art by Tommaso Bianchi. Uh, Mattia Iacono as a colorist, all letters by Clayton Cowles. And of course, a few covers, including the main cover by Pat Gleason, uh, which looks Pretty gnarly. Uh, the chest burst are really like, there's a lot of detail there. Uh, maybe more than I would like to see. Uh, so this anthology continues to kick ass. As I mentioned, I'm not going to talk about the Utopia story until part four, which is the next issue. Uh, so I'll cover, I'll do a full review of that story then in the last video. Uh, but in the meanwhile, in this issue, the star-studded Killfist continues uh, in Utopia. Colin Kelly, Jackson Lansing, and Michael Dowling take you through the collapse of the civilization that believe could overcome the worst of human nature and live in permanent peace. But in the war against the xenomorphs overtaking their home, the citizens of the ship 
forward find themselves breaking every principle. Let's take a look at some of the preview art for that uh, for that story since I just kind of talked about it. Just so you can see what Michael Dowling's bringing to the... Oh, man, it is so cool. I just... I don't even know how to describe the little... It, it looks like very scratchy. I like the little... It's very angular as well. A lot of sharp edges in the figures. Um, enough detail there to really paint the picture. Uh, and of course, just enough shadows to really bring things on the outline. But I love this. The four panel page. It, this is a double spread in the comic that you can see just like the city just falling apart, right? Just everything going wrong. So, all right, let's talk about the next story, Gear and the Machine, which was probably my favorite in this one. It felt like it was a little oversized too. I didn't go back and count the pages, but definitely feels a little oversized. Uh, this is a Cody Ziegler story that goes guts deep into the core of human evil. Uh, this story is about two technicians that are harvesting chest bursters before they can actually burst out. Uh, so let me pull up some of the preview art here. Um, as you can see here, we're looking at something pretty disgusting. And this is definitely what the main cover was probably alluding to. Uh, and we just see some technicians working, right? I love seeing like little side stories and how everything can go wrong in this world for uh, even if you just work in Wayland Utani, if you're involved with the xenomorphs in some sort of form or way, uh, like it, this is just, it's what's going to happen. Uh, but it's very cool, really fun story. Uh, and then last, but definitely not least, we have Lucky, uh, which is Steve Fox. Flipping the viewpoint in a way that will tug at the heartstrings of even the most seasoned Alien fan. An unmissable piece of the universe spanning franchise. And that is because this is about a dog. In this story, you follow this dog. And things could be... Thinking like Last time we saw a, a dog in Aliens, it didn't turn out too well for them. At least the last time I saw a dog in Alien 3. Um, so, yeah. Once again... Fantastic art. I, I love the look of the dog. Like, just really tugs at the heartstrings. Um, so, great stories, all three of them. Like I said, I'll talk more about the first one at the end and just do an overall review. But this anthology con uh, continues to kick ass, and I'm really, really enjoying it. So... Hello, everyone. Daniel here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for... Vengeance of the Moon Knight, number four. This is a new book from Marvel Comics. So let's take a look at the creative team. In this issue, Hunter's Moon. Uh, this is written by Jed McKay with art by Alessandro Capuccio. Uh, colors by Rachel Rosenberg and letters by Corey Petit. Really cool cover by David David, David Paratore. Uh, and of course, some other band covers you'll see at the end of the video. Stay tuned for that. In this issue, Brawl in the Family. This is the issue for Hunter's Moon, each issue has been not from the point of view, but I guess kind of from the point of view of each of the members of the Midnight Mission. Um, so in this issue, as the fearsome Hunter's Moon, Yeha Badr, and is the brother to the fallen Moon Knight, Mark Spector, but there is an imposter loose in the city wearing his brother's face. And Hunter's Moon intends to find out who they are by any means necessary. And I guess... I will tell you this, if you have been looking for the reveal of who's under this Moon Knight suit, you're going to get it in this issue. So make sure to go check that out, first of all. Like, I'm not spoiling who it is, but just know that you will, like, your patience will have paid off. Because I know a lot of people, I'm sure, have been very patient with this book. We are into issue four. The reveal happens in this one. But also, Jed McKay has been doing this really great thing where every one of the, every one of the members of the Midnight Mission has been visiting with the doctor that Mark was talking to, right, to really help him emotionally and talk about everything that's going on. And that's kind of the framing device that we are seeing here uh, to move these stories along. Uh, I think also seeing Hunter's Moon uh, teaming up with Tigra, I think that's very cool. Both of them are probably the closest to Mark uh, from the team uh, for their own specific reasons. Uh, so yeah, this is a very exciting issue. Uh, as I've mentioned in the past, Capuccio's art is just really cool, very dynamic, very, there's a lot of, 
a lot of flow and movement, which I know sounds weird for a static medium, but I mean, that's just kind of the way that I feel it when it when it comes out. Uh, so let's go take a look at some of that preview art so you know exactly what I'm talking about. And there you have it. Like I said, just the characters, the cape flows, the hair. Like you can see a lot of the strands of hair in Tigra. Like all those little details, uh, I think juxtaposed with the static background of the city behind them really makes these figures pop out. Uh, and then, of course, we have the transition over to the doctor's office. Uh, and then the multiple characters in the same page to just denote that movement. Uh, I think characters with a cape definitely allow you to play a little bit more. Of course, Tiger also has long hair and a tail. So, like, all those little details, they just allow you to flow in so much better. And I love I love how, how really uh, Capuccio and the team go to bring movement to this page. If you blink and you miss it, in the sun, you can see the figures, like the little outlines of them, of course. That's where the the first bubbles come in from. And then they kind of just move down through the building, right? Uh, and, of course, they got to figure out who's hiding at the mount. Also, Hunter's Moon has a little bit of a clue as to who this person may be under the mask uh, or, or at least a little bit of their origin. So... Very cool issue. Once again, very much appreciated. I think uh, Jed McKay will be closing out this arc probably in the next issue because I feel like after that, this book will kind of really kick off into the Blood Hunt event. Uh, I think this is one of the books that's going to be the most involved with that. So that'll be really fun to see. So Hello everyone, Dan here from the Next Issue Podcast. On today's video, I'll be doing a review for X-Men number 33. This is a new book from Marvel Comics. So let's take a look at their creative team. This book is written by Gary Duggan with art by Joshua Casara, Romulo Fajardo Jr. of Colors, Letters by Clayton Cowell. Issue 33, as the world burns, uh, we see in the cover not only the X-Men, but the X-Men of Doom, uh, the ones from Latveria. So in this issue, X-Men assemble. Uh, if there were ever a time to rally the troops and take care of the fight, the enemy is now. Uh, stand aside, stand stand aside with the X-Men as they head into their final battle and their final stand. They can't stop us all. Uh, that's right. The X-Men are have a lot of machinations that are out there. Uh, they're going all out on their attack. So let's take a look at the roster for this issue. Uh, I'm glad Marvel does this because there's definitely a lot of uh, people here. So we have Sebastian Shaw. We have his son, Shinobi, uh, Callisto, Emma Frost, Wolverine, Shadowcat, Kate Pride, Forge, Magic, Ms. Marvel, Sync, Cyclops, and Nimrod. And there's many, many more uh, that they did not include here because I think that'd be uh, kind of ruin the surprise. But I really like what Gary Duggan's been doing on these last few issues of X-Men. I think, of course, the fall of Krakoa really, really lies within the other two books, uh, you know, fall and rise. But this book is being used to kind of do a little bit of the cleanup, get us there, figure out what each of these characters are doing. Uh, of course, we have Sebastian Shaw, who no matter who is, on, you know, no matter who the fight is for, uh, definitely he just he's just trying to be on the winning side, no matter who he has to betray. Uh, that all comes into play. Uh, he's trying to kick some people off of Madripoor because he's trying to buy always the villains with their real estate schemes. Uh, so he sends um, the Reavers, which, boy, I hate the Reavers, especially when they look like their guns are covered in skin. You'll see some of that in a minute in the art. Uh, but, yeah, the Reavers suck. Uh, so let's take a look at some of that preview art here. As I mentioned, we see Sebastian Shaw always looking classy. We see his son as well getting a suit. Uh, and then here we see the Reavers attack on Madripoor's uh, slums, trying to clear out the people. They capture Callisto. Now, I really like this uh, last panel of the... I think it's more impactful that we don't see the detail, just see the shadow of the hit in Callisto's patch. Uh, and then we have this really cool sequence as well uh, with Wolverine later on. Um, as they lay a trap, like I like that 
Joshua Kassara chose not to go on full on with the gore and just instead shows like these little super violent moments, the snippets. Uh, I love seeing the 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 eye of this dude under his helmet, right with the shock and awe of like how he died and the pile of bodies because Wolverine truly is the best at what he does. Um, so yeah, this book was a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying it. Uh, as I mentioned, and you saw on the cover, the X-Men from Latveria uh, that work on their Doom also show up. Uh, so it's a really cool team up. I like that Kamala definitely has taken a bigger role in the X-Men. Hopefully that will continue in the next era of X-Men. Uh, and of course, some really cool variant covers uh, that you'll see at the end of the video. So stay tuned for that. So if you have read this, let me know what you thought about it down in the comments as always. Thank you for watching, everyone. Remember to share, like, subscribe. Hit the bell so you know when we go live. That is most Saturdays, 10 a.m. Central Standard Time. Stay tuned. We have more comic reviews, trailer reactions, TV recaps, all that fun stuff here in the channel. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye-bye.